Hello, I'm Steve McCool from the University of Montana, and I thought I'd just briefly introduce myself before we get into a discussion of how we can integrate communities, protected areas, and tourism, an issue of vital importance to many of the 177,000 protected areas that exist in the world today. I'm on the faculty at the University of Montana, actually I'm retired, and uh, for about 45 years or so, I've been engaged in a long conversation with a variety of protected area managers around the world, dealing with tourism and its management and protected areas, dealing with uh, public engagement in protected area planning and management and more recently thinking about how we can strengthen and enhance and transform our planning processes for protected areas so that they are not only more meaningful but they are also areas that are uh, our plans that can be implemented. So follow through the presentation and I think you will enjoy it. If anything that represents the notion of sustainability it's these photographs of young children. Actually, they're my grandchildren. In that the basic purpose, the most fundamental motivation for thinking about sustainability is to provide options for people living in the future. Options for people such as my grandchildren and your grandchildren as well. That they will have the same kinds of opportunities in terms of enjoying and visiting protected areas and benefiting in other ways from them as you and I do now. And so at the heart of this discussion is thinking about the future. The objectives of this particular presentation though are three. The first objective is to identify the current state, the conditions and the processes and the forces and the trends that are having a great influence over our discussion of protected areas, tourism, communities, and visitor experiences. Second objective deals with framing the principal questions at a large scale that I see that we are confronted with and provide the, not only the challenges for tourism and protected areas, but also for the opportunities. And third, uh, the objective is to think about the pathway for the future, to think about some things that we can do to build our particular competency in addressing these, these uh, questions. I'd like to say that we are at the dawn, a new dawn, in the management of tourism and visitation. That we know now a lot more about protected areas themselves and about the functions they serve in society and about management of tourism than we did 15 or 20 years ago. And so it is a new dawn. And helping us get through that dawn is a better understanding of where we are at with respect to the forces and trends that are affecting travel and tourism. The first of which deals with the rapid growth in travel that we are experiencing in the first part of the 21st century. These are the projections and actual data as collected by the UN World Tourism Organization. And if you look at this slide carefully, you will see that right now uh, we are a little over a billion international arrivals and of course this is just domestic excuse me it's just international travel it does not include domestic travel we are a little over a billion and in 16 short years to the year 2030 the projections are that there will be about 1.8 billion international arrivals so travel and tourism is increasing quite dramatically as you can see in this graphic and just imagine what it would be like in 15 or 16 years in your particular park or protected area. Think about nearly twice as many visitors. Think about how to get there with highways 
twice as congested as they are now. Think about the airports twice as congested. So we're dealing with, in management, this rapid growth in travel, which is going to stress our capabilities to deal with uh, the increased visitation if we do not start now and develop good frameworks for structuring our thinking about this. And on the other side, um, we have a growth in conservation, and in particularly, in particular, a growth in the number of an acreage uh, included in protected areas. The HE target, target number 11, uh, proposes that we have about 17 percent of the terrestrial surface of the Earth in a, in a protected area in the year 2000. Excuse me, in 2020, the HE target is something that was developed in the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity in the year 2010. And this growth from the from the current time when that was uh, developed in 2010 was uh, to 2020, which is uh, 10 short years and only six years from now, is a growth in protected areas of about 6.5 million to 7 million square kilometers, an area nearly the size of the country of Australia. This will be quite a challenge, not only in terms of achieving this goal, but in terms of also providing good stewardship for these particular areas. And then the third factor that we have to deal with are a variety of global forces that influence tourism and protected areas climate change. Of course, we've heard all about climate change and the great deal of uncertainty that the future lies uh, before us with respect to the kind of climate and its consequences for protected areas. Population. The population is growing dramatically. Uh, not only is population, human population increasing, but it's also aging and there's also quite a bit of migration, generally from rural areas to urban areas. Technology. Uh, is a great uh, acceleration accelerant for sustainable tourism and its management. Governance, we, we see despite some of the activities in the last few years, we see a growth in democracy and, then, and the, what that means for public engagement in planning and management. We see significant changes in public values, generally uh, values that are much more sensitive to conservation and values that are also oriented toward learning about biodiversity and our natural heritage. We also see a strive for more open, transparent, and accountable decision making. How, do, how are we going to manage these protected areas? The people want to know. Visitors want to know. The public wants to know. And finally, we see a significant economic restructuring occurring, a movement from manufacturing based uh, economies to service and knowledge based economies. And that restructuring has a lot to say about how people enjoy their leisure time. The consequence of these trends means that uh, managing protected areas will be increasingly contentious. It will be more volatile in terms of uh, uh, securing access to protected areas for visitors. And it also means that high, the stakes are going to be much higher because there's much more money involved, to be very frank about it, in decisions about protected area management and who gets to provide the stewardship of those protected areas. We also see a greater demand for economic parity. And this graph shows the proportion of the, of the population in the world that would be in poverty assuming different levels of income. So for example, if we were to look at the, uh, the bar that has two dollars at the uh, bottom of the graph, uh, what that means is that of the, if, that's, if we draw the line at two dollars a day, two US dollars a day for people being in poverty, that is if, if you earn less than two dollars a day you would be in poverty. Uh, we see 2.6 billion people in at that poverty level. That was in 2005. That's 40 percent 
of the population. And what, what the consequence of this is, the important consequence is that more and more communities, regions, and countries are turning to tourism as a way of dealing with alleviating poverty. So the question uh, that results from this little uh, uh, review of the current state is what role does tourism and protected areas play in this, in this incredibly dynamic, demanding, diversifying, and contentious environment? Okay, that's where you are as a protected area manager. That describes what your world is like and increasingly it's going to be like over the next 15 or 20 uh, years or so. Another issue that comes to bear is your own capacity to manage. This is a list of competencies that was developed by a group of World Heritage Site Managers uh, uh, several years ago in a meeting that I helped facilitate uh, in Yellowstone National Park itself, a World Heritage Site. And we asked them what kinds of competencies are needed to manage tourism and visitation uh, in World Heritage Sites, in natural protected areas. And these are the kinds of uh, competencies that they came up with. And I'm not going to read all of them, but you can see that, there's, that they are quite diverse. And, and incidentally, these are competencies, so, say, at the mid-level. Uh, things like developing a vision for an area, things like um, working with stakeholders and outreach and engaging them, things like uh, knowledge of phys facility and infrastructure design and construction, things like monitoring, act operational competencies such as just uh, working in administration and human uh, resources, dealing with marketing, dealing with regulation and enforcement. These are the kinds of things that managers have to have in their skill set. And obviously not everyone is going to be competent in every one of these particular proficiencies, but they must have access to them in order to manage tourism and visitation appropriately in their particular area. And so what this particular presentation is devoted to is understanding the context and framing the questions that will help guide us into the future. The result of all these things is that there are broader expectations of protected area functions. It used to be that protected areas dealt with uh, pro protecting scenery and serving as to recover uh, wildlife uh, populations. And now we see that these expectations have broadened to include things like poverty alleviation, protected areas becoming engines of economic development, uh, protected areas serving as models of democratic governance. Protected areas are serving as cauldrons of evolution. These, there are these broader expectations. And as a result, uh, we need, um, there's a growing need for more effective management. Less than probably 30% of protected areas around the world are managed effectively. That is achieving their goals. Quite a sad story. And yet we don't seem to spend very much time and resources on building the capability of these managers and the institutions to become much more effective. And this also means increased stress on management. Um, we're supposed to be doing, as managers, more things of, at once than we used to be. We have to be masters of multitasking, if you will. Now, in thinking about <clears throat> what we're supposed to be doing, I believe we have three fundamental responsibilities for our stewardship of these protected areas. Our first responsibility, or one of the first, is to develop a vision of what this protected area is supposed to look like. And that vision encompasses three components. One in, deals with protecting the values and resources that are contained within our area and for which uh, the area was established to make sure the conservation of these values and resources occur. A second one deals with enhancing the quality of life of people that are our stakeholders and our constituencies. How can this protected area become much more real, relevant or salient to them? And how can it really help to enhance their quality of life? And third uh, is to provide opportunities for employment 
and income. Now this third one is no, often not seen as a responsibility uh, in North America that these that national parks are indeed national parks and that they have a national level uh, vision and responsibility. But in ter actually in terms of what we're supposed to do it's, we're supposed to help, I think. I think, and this is a moral or ethical judgment. We're supposed to provide some kind of assistance, I believe, in helping people uh, uh, make uh, advancements in their own uh, economic standing. And we can do that through a variety of very creative ways without actually getting into the point of managing a community's uh, own ec economy. A second responsibility is designing a pathway to achieve the vision that we've articulated. Um, and so what that means is that we have to identify actions that are effective, that is, do they work? Actions that are efficient, that is, do we get the biggest bang for our buck? And actions that are equitable, which other people might say, are they fair? Uh, for example, do some people, some groups, some constituencies incur greater costs uh, than other constituencies in implementing this pathway? And the third responsibility is to monitor the journey along this pathway. Okay, that is a professional responsibility. And to, we need to monitor uh, so we know that what we thought would happen really happening. A plan in many respects is a set of intended actions that are built upon certain assumptions. One assumption of course is that we know that if we implement one action a consequence will happen. There's other assumptions about the character of the environment or context within which we operate. But we have to monitor the implementation of our plans so that we know if something is working. But we know that once we start implementing a vision, once we start creating a vision and then implementing it and monitoring that there are a lot of obstacles to addressing any of these tasks. The first obstacle that we all raise is that of funding. And indeed that's an important obstacle, but often funding is a function of other kinds of obstacles. Funding uh, is a, a function of uh, politics, for example that many politicians um, make their careers out of giving or taking away gifts that are financed by other people. It's also a function of the emphasis we have in our own protected area organizations toward learning and developing technical proficiency in implementing uh, a particular plan, in working with the public, technical proficiency in developing the vision. Um, another obstacle is the lack of trust that often people, because of broken promises that the government has made in the past, they don't trust the government. They don't trust a particular protected area manager and that has to be dealt with. Institutional design is another obstacle. Many of our institutions, conservation institutions, were designed uh, and organized in either the 19th century or the mid to late 20th century and, that, and they are not particularly well designed to achieve the goals and deal with the problems of the 21st century. And finally many organizations have a procedural orientation. They, uh, they're basically value here is that they, if they have a procedure they go through, that will guarantee that a plan is implemented. So that's kind of the, the status of the, of the world as we see it in a very general way um, that's confronting every protected area manager who's dealing with protected areas and, and tourism. Now the next section of this deals with some fundamental questions for tourism and protected areas. And basically what I'm trying to say here is that the answers you get depend on the questions you ask, something that ought to be self-evident. But if we've learned one thing about managing visitors, 
is that we have to be very careful about how we frame the questions. So in this section, I'm going to talk about several questions that are reframed or framed in ways that you may not have been exposed to. And it's not that they're better, but they are probably more useful in advancing our understanding of management and integration of tourism. So when we talk about sustainable tourism, the question I like to ask is, well, what do we mean? And for me, the fundamental question here is, what is it that tourism should sustain? Uh, does it sustain the quality of life? Does it sustain the natural heritage that we have been offered and provided for by those who have come before us? And does it sustain economic opportunity? Ask, ask this group, uh, this family here in a small village in Zambia, what it should sustain. And you might get a very different answer from them than if you ask each of us. The second question is how do we integrate conservation, community development, and visitor experiences? And many people will say, well, we think it's a matter of balance. You know, we, we have conservation and we have economic development and we've got to kind of balance these two. And I'm not so sure that's a useful way of framing this particular concern. I think a more useful way is to think about how we can integrate them because they're not necessarily opposed to each other. It's not necessarily a zero-sum conflict and that's what when we when we use the term balance we kind of are communicating that we believe these are uh, opposed to each other. They're 180 degrees opposite, that it is a zero-sum conflict. In many cases it's not. So how do we integrate economic opportunity with protection of natural heritage. Now a lot of people when they're confronted with tourism and visitation in parks and protected areas will say we need to take a look at the carrying capacity of, of these parks and protected areas. And this is the only time in this talk I'm going to mention that particular term. It's not a particularly useful term doesn't help us understand what's going on. A much better way to frame that question is to ask how much impact is acceptable or appropriate. So here we have a um, high density resort community in the Mediterranean. It's probably typical of hundreds if not thousands of resorts around the world. And many people uh, the people that you and I will normally interact with are not particularly enamored of this kind of development. And it probably wouldn't be appropriate in many of our parks and protected areas. But a much better question to ask, uh, rather than carrying capacity, is, is it acceptable or appropriate? This is a question of judgment. It's a question of our that we answer integratively with the help of our constituencies and because it is a value judgment. It is a, a function of our belief system. Science plays a very important role in understanding what's the consequences of uh, different levels of impact, but it can't tell us uh, intrinsically about which pathway to, to take. So we need to ask this question. How much impact is acceptable or appropriate in any given situation? Another question dealing with directly with communities is how do we build resiliency into communities? How do we make them responsive to all these global level forces that I mentioned earlier? Whoops, I'm sorry, I hit the button too soon. And I seem to have a glitch. Here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, this makes this video much more um, real life, I guess. So how do we build the resiliency in the communities? How do we make them responsive to these perturbations or disturbances, to use an ecologist term, that are coming from the larger uh, system uh, beyond the boundaries? Hmm, so there still seems to be a problem here. Um, so um, we, we need to think of ways that we can recover from these disturbances. And so we can think of tourism, sustainable tourism, as a way 
to make, for example, the economy of a community much more viable, much more diverse than it is without tourism. So that when there is an economic downturn or some other factor that occurs, we, we have a community and people within it that are resilient, that look upon um, any negative change not uh, as something in despair, but as an opportunity to make the community even better. Another question is, well, what experience, visitor experience opportunities do we provide? And this is a question that I often ask and I often wonder when I go to conferences on sustainable tourism, no one ever seems to ask. No, the visitor experiences are the products that we indeed provide. So what is it that we're going to provide? Are we going to provide, such as in this slide, which is in Ayutuk in the northeastern Canadian Arctic, are we going to provide a, a great opportunity for solitude and adventure? And, and in a sense, even though it's in a remote and undeveloped environment, it's kind of a soft adventure that you can take a person from Toronto or Montreal and put them in this environment with some instruction and with the right equipment, of course, and with a, a, level, a little bit of skill, and they can survive and have a great time. Or, do we, or is it some kind of opportunity like this? This happens to be uh, a, a photo of visitors in Yellowstone National Park in the United States waiting for the Old Faithful Geyser to erupt. And if there's one place in the United States that we have a national pilgrimage to, it's to, national, it's to Yellowstone National Park. They're waiting there. There might be 3,000 people sitting around the benches waiting for Old Faithful to erupt, which takes about a minute or so, and then they leave. We provide opportunities like this. So we have to answer that question because it's the kind of question, because the, the way, excuse me, the way in which we answer it then affects all the other kinds of things that we do in a park in terms of infrastructure, in terms of transport, in terms of rules and regulations, and so on, in terms of information as well. How do we enhance management performance? This is something that's, of course, directly relevant to you. Is that, you know, we want our managers to perform well. We want them to be able to do the three things that I've out, I outlined at the very beginning. Now, we can build professional competency, and that's what we're doing uh, basically in this presentation. And building professional competency increases the potential for uh, a manager to perform well. But it doesn't guarantee enhanced performance because there are a whole bunch of other factors such as the organization itself and its reward system that influence performance. So building professional competency is a necessary but not sufficient um, condition for enhanced performance. So what's the pathway to the future? How are we going to wrestle with these uh, uh, questions and with with the kinds of global level processes, forces, and trends in which we are confronted with. And I'm going to be the first to say that this is not all fun and games, that this sometimes is going to be difficult, and other times it's even going to be more difficult to address these uh, particular questions. But how can we make it a little bit easier on ourselves? And so there's a number of ways that we can do this. First way is that we can engage complexity. And a second thing we've learned, if, uh, in addition to the, how we frame our questions, is that we live in a complex world with lots of interacting parts and lots of relationships between the parts that we don't necessarily understand. And we can engage that complexity to help build our understanding. We can engage that complexity by using systems thinking. And when we use systems thinking, we can think again about the kinds of tasks that we have in achieving uh, those three uh, responsibilities. We have to manage competing demands. Do we manage a park for its wildlife and for thatching grass? Do we manage a park for its scenic beauty and for poverty alleviation? How do we resolve these competing demands? We have to build and maintain relationships 
with our constituencies. The, in a complex world, nothing gets done if we don't have good relationships. And in a complex world, that means there's uncertainty. That means we have to continually en engage in joint learning between ourselves and our constituencies. constituencies. So we need to think about systems thinking and how we can benefit from uh, complexity thinking. We can think differently about the world, and that's what I've tried to do in suggesting those several questions. Is that you know what again? The answers we get are a function of the questions we ask. So first of all, we have to recognize that in thinking differently, that protected area systems are dynamically complex. That is, a little bit of change in one factor may result in big change in another factors. There are delays between causes and effects, temporal delays. There are often also spatial delays, that an effect may occur in a different site than where we actually implemented an action. Uh, protected areas are ever-changing. It's very difficult to predict what's going to happen tomorrow as well as next year, and they are impossible to completely understand. We will never have enough knowledge to completely understand the kind of system in which a protected area exists. So this is a picture of an iceberg. And you might wonder, what has an iceberg got to do with planning and managing tourism in protected areas? Well, it has a lot to do with thinking differently and thinking about what lies at the bottom of an iceberg. When we see an iceberg, basically when we, uh, we see the tip, the top 10% or so that occurs above the waterline. And in terms of complex systems, the tip of an iceberg are the events that we see. It might be poaching, it might be visitors uh, hiking on trails, it might be visitors getting too close to uh, marine mammals when they're out on an expedition to look for them. And underlying that tip of the iceberg are a whole set of different things, of patterns of behavior, of a systemic structure that results in certain patterns occur that then lead to these events. And underlying those uh, uh, pat, uh, system at, that system at systemic structure are a series of mental models. And it's this uh, mental model that eventually we'll have to get at. And if we understand this iceberg, we understand that the di by diving deeper conceptually, we get increased leverage on making and affecting change in the world of protected areas and tourism. To, ex to exemplify this, I put up here what's called the Kinesia Triangle. And so I'd just like to ask you, take about 10 or 15 seconds, and think about the number of triangles that you see here. How many triangles can you get? Take a few seconds to think about that. Okay, so some of you said you see one. A bunch of you said probably two to four. Several of you have even said or thought or proposed that you might see as, as many as eight triangles. In reality, there are no triangles in this figure. It only appears to be triangles, and you will see there's no complete triangle. Why do we see triangles when none exist? It's because of our perception of shapes, which are formed by our mental model. So when we see a figure that looks like this, say particularly the unlined figure that's central to uh, the, uh, the, the, tri uh, the larger figure, we see a triangle when none really exists. It's because of our mental models. Our mental models are so powerful they influence us so much that we see things that don't really exist. And they are so powerful that we will often not see things when they actually do exist. They're so powerful. <coughs> Pardon me again. They are so powerful that we will, that scientists will often not see evidence of certain things 
when that evidence is right before their eyes. Okay, so it's our mental models. They have a tremendous influence on what, what it is we see, even with respect to, to travel and tourism. And they are so powerful that they can handcuff our thinking if we're not aware of them. So is a mental model. Um, it's a term, the technical term for it is a paradigm. Um, they develop out of our prior success in dealing with problems. Hmm, here's how we deal with something um, because we've been successful using that technique in the past. Uh, but how we've done things in the past may not be applicable in the future because the future is no longer like the past. We are living in this complex world which I mentioned earlier. And what was successful in the past may lead to failure in the future. Paradigms, when we shift paradigms or mental models, the followers of the current paradigm are it's difficult for them to understand and change to a new paradigm. So going back to this term, which I thought I wouldn't say again, but I will in this presentation, is the idea of carrying capacity. Many people are wedded to this idea that, that there is an inherent carrying capacity for tourism in a protected area. I've offered a different question. I frame that concern in a different way. It's very difficult for people who are wedded to that carrying capacity paradigm to reverse themselves and ask the question, what conditions are acceptable or appropriate? Okay. Well, here's some fam familiar examples of paradigm shifts that we see in the world. Up until 1968, this analog watch was the dominant paradigm for how you tell time on a wrist. After 1968, that paradigm changed to a more digital representation of time. Who invented the digital watch, you might ask the question. How did that come about? It was actually invented by a series of, uh, by several engineers working for a Swiss watch manufacturer. The manufacturer, the company, the CEO, and so on, when presented with the model of the digital watch, rejected it and said, that's not a watch, and showed the engineers the door. They sold their idea to watchmakers in Japan, and as a result, those watchmakers made a lot of money, and in Switzerland, a lot of employees went out of, uh, lost their jobs. Another one, ha, ah, the LP, the analog way in which we used to play music. Then that went to digital, to CDs, and of course now it's even gone beyond CDs. You don't even buy CDs anymore. You download from them from the web. Here's another one for you. This is a photo of the very first camera I had. It was called the Kodak Brownie. So that was again analog. It, it was made by Kodak, which was the dominant manufacturer of film in the world. Kodak was offered another approach to imaging back in the 19, uh, late 1930s. And uh, the person who's, who uh, invented this alternative method said, took, took his invention to Kodak. They said that's not the way images are supposed to be made. They showed that person the door, and that person made his own company. It's called Xerox and that person made a billion or so dollars. And of course now we even have a different way of making images and that's through a digital camera. So there are a lot of shifts in paradigms that occur every day. You can probably think of some others. Here's one that's very practical. I was in Mozambique a number of years ago with one of my graduate students that graduate student uh, took me out, you know, out and about, and we had a flat tire. And so we went to change the flat tire. And uh, notice this, that there are two different designs to the lug nuts on this flat tire. We could not get the tire off because the bottom lug nut there didn't fit our lug nut wrench. And so we had no way 
to get this tire off and off the wheel and to be able to change it for one that wasn't flat. Now that was because our dominant paradigm was to take a wrench to the lug nut. We were sitting beside the highway not trying to figure out what to do when somebody came by and asked us what the problem was. To that person it wasn't a problem at all. He simply got out of his pickup truck, a sledgehammer, and broke the lower lug nut off the bolt. And you see here, we were blinded by our paradigm. We were handcuffed in our thinking about our paradigm. That we could not get that lug nut off because we were thinking of a wrench, whereas this alternative uh, came along with just a hammer and knocked it off. So it, blind, it can blind your thinking. Now, briefly, some paradigm changes in recreation management. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Um, we can manage for activities versus managing for experiences. Uh, we can use incremental ad hoc decision making versus using a framework to help us think through the decisions we make. We can focus on biophysical attributes as being the basis for visitors and tourism or focus on the values of those biophysical attributes. We can focus on trying to understand what the average visitor needs or we can focus our efforts on developing an understanding of their emotions and segmenting visitors based on their motivations. We can think of recreation planning or visitor planning as separate from implementation when indeed actually we need to think of planning and implementation as simply two phases of the same activity. We can think of identifying a caring capacity versus identifying acceptable uh, conditions. We can focus on a site versus focus on regional level management. We can conceive of planning as a technical exercise versus planning as a way of building capacity. We can think of our destination of the area, its end state is static versus its very dynamic, which contemporary ecology will tell us that. And we can think of focusing on events and not understanding the system underlying these events. So these are some changes that are undergoing right now in visitor management. So what I recommend here is that we dive deeper to understand what, it, what mental models that we are using and to think differently. A third action is to empower people. And, okay, we can empower people, and particularly our employees, but not just our employees, that's the focus of this, but our constituencies as well, is engaging the public and working with them as equals in developing their capacity to understand the complexities of protected area management and managing tourism within protected areas by building their ecological and managerial literacy, developing their political literacy as well, developing competency, that is giving uh, empowering managers to become really competent in an area of visitor tourism management. And the hundreds of managers that I have interacted with around the world, only a few, maybe 10%, uh, thinking proportionately, actually have technical competency in visitor management. Most of them who are trying hard and are good people are competent in biology and ecology, but not in tourism and visitor management. And then we empower our people through transforming the institutions that uh, in which they are working. That, uh, that is by giving them opportunities to practice, giving them opportunities to build their confidence, and rewarding good and productive and effective uh, management. So I'd like to end with that uh, comment. I hope that this has formed a basis for some discussion and some other questions. And I also invite you to take a look at my uh, blog, which I occasionally uh, contribute to, that's got a number of essays that reinforce the kind of message that I've been giving here. So again, thank you, and you have my best wishes for a productive 
um, career.